Welcome to module 2 of Physics 10 online. This is uh, Dr. Jan Robantang from the National Institute of Physics, University of the Philippines, Diliman. In this part of the series, we will discuss the development of the physical models of the universe, basically answering the question, how did we come to realize that the Earth is not the center of the universe? We begin by discussing the philosophical backgrounds that led to the early models of the universe, particularly that of Ptolemy. The model of Ptolemy led to the development of the Copernican model and culminated to the model of Kepler. Kepler's model, in turn, can later be seen as an important contribution to the success of Newtonian mechanics. We will follow the flow of the discussion from the book Seven Ideas That Shook the Universe by Spielberg and Anderson. In the first two chapters of the book, they discuss the development of the Copernican astronomy and the Newtonian mechanics and causality. These two topics are part of the seven ideas that uh, are discussed in the book. One, the Earth is not the center of the universe. Two, the universe is a mechanism run by rules. Three, energy keeps this mechanism going. Four, entropy tells how this mechanism goes. Five, facts are relative but the laws are absolute. Six, there's a fundamental limit in knowing and predicting. And seven, there are fundamental things that do not change. Here are the references that are used in developing this talk. You may request an updated copy of this list from your faculty in charge. In order to understand how the, the uh, different models of the universe develop over time, we need to understand that the development of models, of physical models in particular, is uh, very dependent on our philosophy or understanding of the philosophy of nature and therefore of science itself. The development of uh, the different models of the universe is highly influenced by the socio-economic and technological factors available at the time. It is usually based on the most expansive and recent data available, such as availability, accuracy, and precision of such data. It is also important to realize that our science today is limited to the immediate causes of things and phenomena and therefore focus mostly in the mechanistic models. In our science today, especially in physics, the object of study is essentially the physical universe or the corporeal realm. The range of sizes of objects in the known physical universe, both speculated and actually observed, is vast from the smallest up to the giants and the largest so far. Here is a link uh, that uh, provides us a, a glimpse of what we so far know from the smallest and the largest. As of this recording, the URL leads you to either a, an online view of uh, the application, or you may also download this as an app into your mobile units. Today we already know that our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy, a huge collection of stars, which in turn is actually part of a much larger conglomeration of other galaxies in the universe. The current model of the universe developed from the early European models rather than the early Eastern models of the universe. While we discuss only the early European models, it is important to emphasize that these European models are also influenced by Eastern philosophers. Most of the early models of the universe, especially in the East, tend to emphasize in the mystical reasons or causes into their models. This is one of the major factors that slowed the development towards the modern science that we know. A good review of the contributions of the early Arabic and Jewish persons can be found in a book 
to save the phenomena, an essay on the idea of physical theory from Plato to Galileo. We will discuss only a limited major models of the universe, such as the, the development of the Ptolemaic model, the Copernican model, and the development of the Kepler's model. We will start with the Ptolemaic model. The most advanced philosophy and rationality closest to our current scientific achievement is best represented by the early Greek achievements. Other civilizations have limited their knowledge into mystical and practical applications rather than the pursuit of deeper reality and truth. A book by Stephen Barr entitled A Student's Guide to Natural Science gives a more extensive argument on how the other civilizations are not able to develop philosophies that can rival those of the Greeks in the early Western Europe. The prominent Greek philosophers are rep most represented in this famous fresco painting by the Italian Renaissance artist Raphael. These different figures in philosophy helped shape over hundreds of years our knowledge about the universe we live in. To provide you a context of how these philosophical ideas or scientific ideas are distributed over time, on how they succeed one another, on how they were developed in parallel of each other, we show here a timeline of philosophers starting from Thales of Meletus, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, even to the time of Ptolemy. You will notice that there are many other philosophers that are not included in this timeline. The early Greek philosophers already knew that there is order in the universe and that this order can be understood via our reason. By reason, we mean how human can understand the universe. There are two great ideas from the early Greeks, basically that reason can be, can, could be systematically employed to enlarge our understanding of reality and that events in the physical world can be given natural explanations. Thales of Meletus is said to have explained earthquakes by positing that the earth floated on water. He speculated that water is the fundamental element from which all other things emanate or can be derived from. This, therefore, uh, provides us the background of the beginning of our understanding of what we call the fundamental elements. By the time of Plato and Ptolemy, these fundamental elements has expanded to four, earth, water, and fire. In the modern times, after the atomists, we reached 118 or so chemical elements. And in the current time, we are now down to 16 basic elements, their antiparticles, and the Higgs boson to total about 33 fundamental particles. From the idea that events in the physical world can be given natural explanations, and that this understanding can be enlarged or expanded using the human reason, debates on ontological understanding of the universe naturally followed suit. Two ontological positions on reality fought head to head, resulting to the division among early Greek philosophers. Those who espouse that change is the one, the only one real, and those that espouse the change in, in fact just an appearance of one constant. Heraclitus sides with the idea that the world was in constant flux. Underlying all this change is what he called reason or logos. Heraclitus is known for the statement, no man ever steps in the same river twice. He believes that everything in the universe flows or panta ray. The other side of the debate is represented by Parmenides. For Parmenides, 
change is only an appearance and that there is only constant in the universe. Parmenides defends the key understanding of reality is rather an ontological one. He is famous in saying, out of nothing, nothing comes. Often, his teachings are summarized as whatever is, is, and what is not, cannot be. He believed that the universe is just one constant being and that all changes are rather just appearances. Mathematics as being central to scientific research today is rooted in the Pythagoreans or the followers of Pythagoras. Pythagoras is the man behind the famous mathematical equation known as Pythagorean Theorem that says that in a right triangle, the sum of the squares of the measures of its legs is equal to the square of the measure of its hypotenuse. For Pythagoreans, numbers are part of truth itself and they consider them divine. They also believe that all numbers are rational and that they are always represented as a ratio of two whole numbers. This belief was seriously challenged when they themselves discovered that this is not always true. This is due to their discovery of the existence of some irrational numbers such as square root of 2, square root of 3, and so on. It is believed that the Pythagoreans swear with their life not to tell this to anyone. Other interesting facts related to Pythagoras and the theorem named after him are linked in this slide. The most important contribution of Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans is the belief that universal true statements can be found via mathematics. You know, this understanding of uh, mathematics providing uh, universal true statements is understandable. 1 plus 1 is always 2. 2 plus 2 is always 4, regardless of what civilization or language or culture you come from. Since the time of Pythagoras, mathematics as a language of science has been fulfilled in the later generations. In the early times, music and astronomy are mathematical in nature. Together with music, the early astronomy is closely associated with math eventually in physics via the medieval philosophers and ultimately with Newton and his contemporaries, placed mathematics as the mainstream method in concretely expressing scientific statements. Quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, has become a standard part of the seven, seven liberal arts of classical antiquity. This standard is carried over to our modern times imparting math and geometry centrality in many of our sciences. By the time of Plato, geometry has uh, taken an important prominence in the understanding of the reality of the universe. Plato is the first to propose to relate geometrical and kinematical properties to the sense of perfection of things in the universe. He proposed that constancy is an indicator of the perfect state of things. One aspect of life, as an example, is the repetition of life's natural rhythm. Once the rhythm is missed or skipped, we talk about an unbalanced life. Even biological life is teeming with constancy, such as heartbeat and the daily cycle of sleep and wake states. On the other hand, geometrical shape hints perfection. Beautiful faces has been related to symmetry of faces. Thus, shapes that provide constancy of view is deemed perfect. Of these three shapes shown here, we can say that circle is the perfect or the most perfect shape because in whatever angle you rotate the figure, you always see the same thing. Anything perfect must therefore have a shape or at least connected with the shape of circles and that its motion must also be constant. Plato is able to reconcile the issue of constancy 
and the change of things in this universe. It was Plato who introduced that while there are things that do not change, there are perceptions of change as well. He solved this issue by proposing two separate existing worlds. The world of forms that takes care of the constancy. This world is apprehended by understanding, not by sentence, senses, and that they are always there eternally. The physical world he called cosmos is the reason why we see change in the universe. This can be grasped by opinion and sense perception or the senses. This is created from the models of their form from the world of forms. The things in the cosmos is for him a participation to the constants. The particular things are therefore shadows of the forms. Both the forms, the deeper reality, and the actual particular things, the shadows of that reality, are true and or real part of this universe. This concept is best illustrated in his works in the form of allegories, the allegory of the divided line and the allegory of the cave. Plato essentially sets the tone of the philosophical or scientific discussions of his students. It is in his time that the important idea started, an idea that our knowledge of the mysteries of the universe can be attained by the human intellect through the systematic use of human reason in analyzing all that we sense. Since Plato's time, it is becoming clear that the knowledge of this universe can only be achieved through our observations, that our senses help our intellect in knowing things based on what it observes. Today, observation typically includes measuring things involved in natural phenomena, also called naturalistic observation, or in controlled phenomena called experimental observation. Art, on the other hand, is the production of things that can be sensed based on what is conceived in the mind or the intellect. From this philosophy, our reason is therefore compelled to find out the forms or the form that produces the things we sense or see in the world. It was Plato who sets us to find out how the universe appears to us as we observe it. In astronomy, this is known as saving the appearances. We can therefore say that the Platonic tradition set the trajectory of astronomy. In one of the books of Pierre Duhem, to save the phenomena, exactly, it is quoted, Plato lays down the principle that the heavenly body's motion is circular, uniform, and constant, constantly regular. Thereupon, he sets the mathematicians the following problem. What circular motions, uniform and perfectly regular, are to be admitted as hypotheses so that it might be possible to save the appearances presented by the planets? He continues, The object of astronomy is here defined with utmost clarity. Astronomy is the science that so combines circular and uniform motions to yield the models that are useful in his time. With the contributions of the succeeding philosophers, with their observations and rudimentary measurements, we eventually got the Ptolemaic model. The different scientific ideas that led to the Ptolemaic model must be understood by way in which Plato sets it up. The ideas that they can propose can only be based on what they can observe. By the time, the known objects in the universe are as follows. The terrestrial region, which is basically what we observe in Earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, the last four being found in the sky or seen in the sky. The planets are also considered the stars, except that they move about in comparison to the regular motion of the stars. The different symbols used for these known objects in the sky are as follows. Sun, 
Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Shown here is also a copy of the 2nd century globe of the heavens from the Greek or Roman antiquity copied from that work of Eudoxus. It is found in the National Museum in Naples. In the early Greeks, objects are contrasted to motion. Motion is a term used for change. The objects in the sky under, undergo at least two general motions, diurnal and annual. On one hand, from the name diurnal, we can guess that diurnal motion refers to the regular pattern of changes observed over one day. Examples of this being the rising of the sun from the east and the setting of the same to the west. Another one is the daily rotation of the star constellations about the Polaris or the North Star. The annual motion, on the other hand, is the yearly pattern of changes or shifts observed in the diurnal motion. From summer to winter, the specific location of the sun's rising and setting shifts slightly towards the north. This process is reversed from winter back to summer. Over a year, at specific times of the day, the observed locations of the sun, the moon, and the planets, the wandering stars, relative to the seemingly fixed background zodiacal constellation also follows a regular pattern. For example, Around September 22 to October 22 each year, the sun resides or is found about the location of the constellation Libra. It then moves to the region of the constellation Scorpio from October 23 to November 22, then to the region of Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, and so on covering the entire 12 zodiac signs for over the year. Remember that the data they have are based on naked eye measurements that cannot resolve small variations in the celestial motions. Thus, so far that the data they have, the heavens, or the cello in Latin is concerned, the heavens must be perfect, as celestial objects, the sun, the moon, stars, and the planets, and as their motions are concerned. Being considered perfect, celestial objects are thought to be made of perfect substance called ether, and their diurnal and annual motions appear as a result of the combination of circular and perfectly uniform movements. Meanwhile, all observations of things and their motion on Earth, sublunar region, are anything but perfect. Those things are imperfect in a sense that they change in their physical or chemical properties and ultimately appear, decay, and eventually disappear in existence over time. Terrestrial objects are corruptible, composed of matter that decay or change in composition over time, consistent with the atomists. These material changes are explained in terms of either a rearrangement or even substantial changes of the basic elements found in the sublunar region fire, air, water, and earth. Terrestrial locomotion, or change in position, is also not consistent or uniform. Rolling objects eventually stop, water eventually rests, wind dies down, and arrows or cannons eventually fall back to the ground. It is therefore acceptable for the early Greeks to adhere to what we now call the two-domain view of the universe. It is in this philosophical basis that all models leading to the Ptolemaic model are founded on. Shown here is a table summarizing the properties of the objects found in these two domains. Note carefully that the different terrestrial motion is helpful in understanding the development of Newtonian mechanics starting from the physics based on the teachings of Aristotle. Plato formalized the model of the universe consisting of several spheres, the sublunar sphere, the spheres of the moon, of the planets, of the sun, and the fixed sphere of the background stars. The daily and annual patterns of the sky 
both the movement across the background fixed stars and their relative positions, including the eclipses, can be explained as shadows of the movement of these spheres about the stationary Earth. The Earth is in the exact center of the universe to which all temporal and corruptible things fall into. Meanwhile, perfect things rise towards the realm of the highest heavens where gods and goddesses are thought to reside or live. Plato also proposed the association of the basic elements of the universe to three-dimensional geometric shapes. These basic 3D geometric shapes are now known as platonic solids. These platonic solids will be eventually tried with by Kepler in fitting the astronomical data collected by Tycho Brahe, or Tycho Brahe only to prove them without much use. One of the first mathematical treatment of the problem of saving the appearances is done by Eudoxus of Nidus. Eudoxus solved the mathematical problem posted by Plato by adding more spheres to produce more detailed daily and annual motion, including the changes in the inclination across the sky. These additional spheres are called auxiliary spheres as they help produce the appearance of wandering motion relative to observers from Earth. The use of such auxiliary spheres is the beginning of the utility of mathematical devices in explaining or saving the appearance. Devices greatly improve the power in which models predict astronomical events, seasonal changes, and farming in relation to the regular overflow of waters and also the timing of religious and civic feasts. Other similar devices were proposed and used by astronomers. By the time of Ptolemy, these devices are already extensively used by several philosophers and astronomers. Notable by the time of Aristotle that the philosophy of nature and motion is already well, well established as evidenced by his cosmological model. His model is an improvement from his teacher Plato and other astronomers such as Eudoxus. It is in his model that the philosophy of his time was integrated into. With his doctrine of four causes, he introduced the use of philosophical concepts into physics closely related to those still used today. Potentiality and actuality, motion as conversion from potential to act, the use of the terms dunamis or dynamics of today, of kinesis or kinetics of today, matter and form combination or hylomorphism, separation of science into physics and metaphysics. Actually, the separation of physics and metaphysics is based on the arrangement of the books of Aristotle in such a way that um, it starts from what can be sensed, therefore you have to study physics, and proceed to universal ideas, and therefore go to metaphysics or beyond physics. Books in the library section and the works of Aristotle usually begins with physics, and the section after or beyond physics, and therefore metaphysics. The model of Aristotle can be said to be the first mechanistic model of the universe. It is mechanistic in a sense that all motions of the celestial spheres is thought of as emanating from a single source that Aristotle referred to as the prime mover. One can think of his model as composed of spheres with interlocking cogs in which the motion of the sphere, the prime mover, is transmitted to all the other spheres. You can imagine, from the complexity of planetary motions, both daily and annual, requires a rather complex combination of these spheres. The total number of spheres for the Aristotelian, Aristotelian version, therefore, reached 50 and above. This model proved to be very cumbersome without additional mathematical devices. Majority of the models of the universe are geocentric. Very few have suggested a different kind, sun-centered universe or heliocentric model. By geocentric, we mean those models that treat the Earth as the exact center of the whole universe. This term is usually contrasted to a heliocentric model wherein the sun, Helios, is treated as the exact center of the universe. Note that the most recent model of, our, of the universe adopted is neither heliocentric nor geocentric in a sense that spatially, the center of the universe is either debatable or non-existent. 
Aristarchus of Samos is recorded to have proposed a model that placed the sun as the central fire of the universe originally proposed by Plutarch, a sun worshipper. His proposition is recorded in the Sun Reckoner based on the accounts of Archimedes, the discoverer of buoyancy, the Eureka guy. Begin quote. His hypotheses are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves about the sun on the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the middle of the orbit, and that the sphere of the fixed stars, situated about the same center as the sun, is so great that the circle in which he supposes the earth to revolve bears such a proportion to the distance of the fixed stars as the center of the spheres bears to its surface." End quote. Some historians think that Copernicus based his heliocentric model from this model of Aristarchus. His name is easy to remember. Our sun is a star, and he proposed to place it at, at the center of the universe, Aris star <laughs> Another contribution of Aristarchus are the estimates of the size and distances of the sun and the moon. The computations of Aristarchus is unique and his proposed models are based on such measurements and geometrical construction. His measurements, however, are based on wrong base distances and sizes and therefore turns out to be much shorter or smaller than modern estimates. From his size estimates, the expected shifts in the positions of planets over the background fixed stars are so greater than what is actually present. In the absence of such parallax observed, the heliocentric model is quickly eliminated and the geocentric model more favored. Astronomical measurements have become common by the 2nd century BC. An impressive estimate of the Earth's great circumference, and therefore the radius, is recorded to have been done by Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes is one famous for his algorithmic method of finding prime numbers, now called the sieve of Eratosthenes. The method by which Eratosthenes was able to measure the Earth is related to us by other astronomers. The simplified description of this method is shown in the figure here and can be described as follows. Based on the assumption that the sun's rays are practically parallel as the rays reach the spherical earth, the shadow made by two different vertical objects separated by a distance on the surface of the earth is used to measure the angle subtended by the same distance. By a ratio and proportion of the measured dist angle and distance, Eratosthenes was able to estimate the earth's circumference with a 3% error from the reliable estimate of today. This feat is remarkable given the rudimentary measurement methods that they have. Such measurements are the basis of retaining the geocentric model. Additional observational techniques discovered by the 1st century BC resulted to deviations in the so far observed regular motion of the celestial objects. Of these, the two major anomalies are the zodiacal anomaly and the solar anomaly. The zodiacal anomaly are variations in the speed of the celestial objects, especially the moon, as they move along the ecliptic. Solar anomaly is mainly retrograde motion, where planets are observed to stop its forward west-to-east motion, reverse direction, stop again, and finally resume forward motion. These anomalies usually occur over a span of weeks. Shown here, is the retrograde motion of Mars in the year 2003 and 2005. Notice that the retrograde paths of Mars over these years are also not the same. Just imagine being with those ancient astronomers confused by this amazing display of seeming irregularity of the planet's path in the sky each year. We now know that the zodiacal anomaly is mainly due to the effects of planets going fastest as they get nearest from the sun perihelion, and slowest as they get farthest from the sun, aphelion. The same is true for the moon, the perigee, and the apogee. The solar anomaly, on the other hand, are known because of the Earth overtaking the other planets regularly at different points in their orbits. In this slide, you will also see a link to a video explaining retrograde motion and its modern explanation. 
Anomalies of the paths of celestial objects across the fixed background stars were solved by introducing mathematical complexities but involving circles and uniform motions. Two persons became prominent in these areas. Apollonius of Perga, an expert of the analysis of conic sections, used his advanced understanding of geometrical figures to propose possible solutions. These two solutions are now called the eccentric and the epicycle different combinations. Hipparchus of Nicaea, known for having discovered precession of the equinoxes, exploited this method and improved the techniques in computing the right parameters for these devices. For about five centuries since Plato set things in motion, all the devices so far developed are summarized and almost systematically integrated by Ptolemy in his book in the 1st or 2nd century AD. We obtain what is now known as a Ptolemaic model or the Ptolemaic system. This Ptolemaic system is amazingly accurate in being consistent with the conditions of Plato without moving the earth. A link to a video of how the Ptolemaic model can be differentiated from other previous models can be found in the link in the slide. The four devices used to generate the observed annual and daily motion of celestial objects are illustrated in this Wikipedia sketch, epicycle, deferent, eccentric, and equan. For the seven celestial objects, 80 or so epicycles were used to simulate their different periodic trajectories in the sky. There are many existing videos of how the Ptolemaic model generates the motion of celestial objects in the sky. These devices employed by Ptolemy in his models can be viewed in the link shown here. Epicycles are circular orbits about a center that in turn revolves around another path called the deferent. The deferent is a circle whose center is away from the Earth. This center is called eccentric. The celestial object's orbital speed along the deferent varies to produce the slowing down or speeding up of the orbit as viewed from the Earth. This is produced by forcing the orbital speed to be constant relative to a point called equant. The equant satisfies the requirement of Plato for a uniform motion appropriate for celestial objects. Therefore, of the four devices, the first two, the epicycle and the deferent, mainly generates the general motion and periodicity of the retrograde motion of the planets. The second two are used to generate the appearance of non-uniform motion of the planets while maintaining a uniform motion relative to the point called equan. Thus, all this observed appearance of celestial objects in the sky, retrograde motion, varying speeds, and the changing brightness of planets can be generated by the model of Ptolemy. Should any of these are not generated accurately, the Ptolemaic model can be easily adjusted by adding more epicycles. The Ptolemaic model is therefore universal. The mathematical power of this epicyclical astronomy is successfully explained and demonstrated by Norwood Hanson in 1960. He showed that by adding more and more epicycles of correct proportion of sizes and rays of rotation, any periodic orbit can be generated. Even the ellipses of Kepler can be easily approximated. A recent post in YouTube was able to demonstrate this power using epicycles upon epicycles in generating a drawing of Homer Simpson. Indeed, a physics major or a math major can quickly realize that epicycles upon epicycles are a geometric version of Fourier series expansion. You can watch a technical explanation in a YouTube channel link of Mathologer shown here. While the Ptolemaic system can be made as accurate as possible with respect to the available astronomical data, one can say that it's purely kinematical. It only quantitatively describes the motion of the celestial objects without making any philosophical or mechanical basis proven by the inconsistent application of the devices. The accuracy of the Ptolemaic system proved enigmatic by way of interesting questions it elicits. Does the Ptolemaic system correspond to reality? What is the nature of the transparent spheres? Is there a simple model possible? Is it the only alternative they have? The absence of the observed stellar parallax, based on the best measurement methods of the early astronomers, is one of the convincing proof 
that the Earth does not move relative to the sphere of fixed stars. Parallax is the shift in the apparent position of nearer objects relative to more distant background objects as the observer moves from one position to another. Parallax is more pronounced when the observer moves perpendicular across the line of the more distant object. If the Earth moves around the Sun as proposed in the heliocentric models, there should be an expected annual shift in the position of the planets. The expected annual shift, however, were originally overestimated and expected to be observable by the naked eye based on the assumed size of the universe. Thus, being not observed, the heliocentric models cannot be supported scientifically. Of course, given the updated measurements of the dimensions of the universe, the annual shifts are expected to be very small. These small shifts has been observed using the power t powerful telescopes of today. Besides the unobserved parallax, not the one from Green Lantern, and other expected astronomical measurements, there are other empirical evidences that go against the proposition of a moving Earth. In the first place, as the Earth rotates about its axis once every 24 hours, each point near the Earth's equator must have traveled a total distance of about 40,000 kilometers. From these values, one can easily calculate that each point near the Earth's equator is moving at a tremendous speed of over 1,600 kilometers per hour. This speed is more than 80 times the maximum speed of our, our already fast-moving buses in our Luzon Expressways. I wouldn't try to stick out my head out of the window while the bus is moving at maximum allowable speed. How much more for 80 times of that? Now, based on the known physics in their times, it is expected that at this speed, a constant blowing of great winds should be experienced by those near the equator, but there is none observed. On the second place, falling objects must be a lot, a lot more complicated than just the observed simple dropping of objects in a straight line. Thirdly, since the Earth is expected to get nearer or farther from some of the fixed stars at different times of the year, the brightness of these stars must also vary periodically. Again, based on the wrong estimate of distances and sizes, these variations in brightness are expected to be observable via the naked eye. No naked eye variations were observed. It turns out that these variations, although present, are actually very faint for the eyes to observe. Thus, all evidences so far fails to support the heliocentric model. Ultimately, the geocentric model most accurately fits all available astronomical data of the time. In the end, the geocentric model remains the gold standard model of the universe for the early Greek astronomers. Besides this empirical data being absent, scientific evidences contrary to the heliocentric models, the geocentric model is also highly consistent with, especially literally consistent with, the existing philosophical ideas about the universe. The geocentric model is also consistent with major religious beliefs of the time, especially during the Reformation era from the mid-1500s to the mid-1600s in the middle of debates on scriptural or biblical interpretations. This religious turmoil in Europe has caused a great difficulty, especially during the infamous Galileo affair. In any case, it is obvious up to the medieval times that the Earth placed at the center of the universe does not exalt Earth to a special position in the universe. In fact, the most imperfect location is believed the lowest of all, the center of the universe, where everything falls towards two. Given the changes in many fronts, scientific, philosophical, and religious, the Ptolemaic system, a geocentric model, as the model of the universe remains in wide use. The success of the Ptolemaic system made it the standard tool for more than 1,400 years since the time of Ptolemy in predicting astronomical events. The Ptolemaic system became a significant aid in computing for seasons and dates important for socio-cultural reasons. Every kingdom assigned one or a team of astronomers 
or mathematicians to update such Ptolemaic system and remain useful until the time of Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. We have just finished the first of the three sections of Module 2. In the next section, Section 2, we will discuss the alternative models such as the Copernican and the Taconic models. You are required to take a short quiz for this section and your faculty in charge will provide you the link.